Today, I'm doing the second ever Zoom interview with Mr. Mm -hmm. Suresh Ramdas, who's Mr. Gay India 2019. Yes. yes. We're doing a, an interview with Suresh because he's very unique, and uh, I'm very honored to be able to include him in our series. So, you're in uh, Bangalore, India, is that correct? Yes, that is correct, Doug, yeah. I've never been there, but I've been to uh, Delhi, Agra, Jaipur, mm -hmm. and I've been to Mumbai more times than I can remember. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, let's go to the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about your family and your early life. All right, so with regarding to my family, uh, so we're just four. Um, my parents uh, have two kids. I'm the second born. So been the, um, I, I would say that I'm a little more loved and a little more spoiled in every way possible as a second born, <laughs> which is pretty much, uh, you know, everywhere across the world that second borns are more loved. Um, about me, as in with my personal life or with my childhood, um, you know, I always tell this to people that, yes, um, you know, I had a very loving and a very caring and a very warm, uh, you know, I mean, childhood in the sense at home. My parents were always there and, um, you know, there was no differentiation in any sort of kinds. Uh, <clears throat> but I think all the differentiation of who I was started when I go to school, right? Uh, First and foremost, yes, I did have a little bit of, um, you know, mannerisms and behaviors which were very uh, feminine. And uh, so I was been, um, you know, in the center of attention for the wrong reasons. And there was another reason also, uh, which is, uh, I, I'm for sure, you know, you all may not kind of comprehend it completely, but yes, color, skin tone as me being dark. Um, you know, was something as an issue for me, uh, not for me personally, but for people around me. And uh, I was always being called out uh, various names for my color and for my mannerisms. So right from childhood, you know, I was always being made feel bad about who I really was. Um, not an easy time, but um, I decided that I'm going to kind of survive that. I was getting very angry, very frustrated. and. Um, my only way to release the frustration was, yes, I used to cry a lot uh, because that was one way of, um, you know, getting things out of my system and not being part of any groups. But then in school, as part of the curriculum, you need to be associated with the groups or with your, uh, you know, classmates. And I really hated that for a simple fact is they were the ones who were bullying and calling me names while I had to interact with them, play with them. So right from young age, I really didn't like uh, sports, which were more of a teamwork. So I hated football or cricket or even basketball, as a matter of fact. But I had this inclination towards sports. So I started getting into athletics uh, because, um, you know, that's a single person sport. And um, I also kind of navigated towards playing tennis. Wow. So I'm a huge, huge tennis fan. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't play tennis anymore. I love to, but I don't get the time or the opportunity. But I used to play, uh, you know, tennis until all the way to my university. So I was a university level tennis player. And I always like to say Steffi Graf uh, is my idol, my fan, and my then online uh, trainer as well. So I used to record all her matches and the, you know, those tapes that you used to get and then rewind them, watch them every time again. So for me, I think that was my way of really getting my you know, frustration out and getting my anger out uh, through playing sports. Why that, uh, <clears throat> sorry? Why don't you have the chance to play more now? Uh, it's just that it's timing and there are not many, you know, tennis courts available. And even if they're available, the, you know, the, the, the timing it really does not work. But I 
yeah, I would love to. Uh, I do have two tennis rackets with me. And every time there is a grand slam that kind of comes up and I'm like, you know, taking the racket and I'm kind of swinging and doing all that, you know, jazz that kind of works on. But uh, yeah, hopefully I'm just uh, pushing myself to, you know, see if I can really get there. So I would love to do that. Um, moving on, I think uh, there was an incident in my life, uh, which kind of was a little bit of a motivating factor for me, which I'll talk a little later. Um, but I think with that strength or with that push that I had, I was able to survive my um, school and my college days as well. So yeah, I mean, it's not been easy. But at the same time, um, you know, I think now looking back, yes, I've learned quite a lot of, from those uh, days. Yeah. You mentioned skin tone a little bit ago. Yes. Uh, yeah. How is that viewed in, in society, in Indian society? <sighs> oh, India was like, uh, I mean, to be honest, I think most of the Indians or majority of the Indians are you know, probably the wheatish or the dark skinned or the brown skinned people. But we have one of the biggest and the largest, um, uh, you know, um, consumption or the consumers for fairness creams is in India. We are close to a $50 million market. Or I, I'm not sure it's a $50 million or $50 billion market, but you can see the number of people wanting to be fair. Fairness creams are at its peak here. Um, again, um, you know, if you have to go back a little bit in the history as to why this fairness thing kind of really crept in was thanks to, again, Britishers. <laughs> they came to India, conquered us, and they stayed there for 200 years. And they always kind of said that the fairer sex is the better sex. But, uh, you know, if you have to look at our history, look at our architecture, look, go back and look at up some of the paintings that were being drawn, uh, which were in color, and none of them were like, you know, majority of them were, uh, you know, on the darker side or the darker skin tone, but still, you know, because of Britishers coming in and being with us for 200 years, they kind of really made us feel shitty about our culture, our skin tone, anything and everything about our, you know, the habits that we had. So this was one of them, and this kind of really inculcated into the culture for such a long time that anybody dark is um, <clears throat> looked down upon or they are considered to be of a lower class, you know, so that's how they used to kind of associate. And this paved a lot of problems for many, many people. I mean, as a guy, imagine if I'm going through this, girls have it even harder. Because, you know, when it comes to the time of marriage, then they always want, no matter how dark the guy is, the guy always wants a fair girl, you know? So that's the stereotype. That's the mindset. You know, even media plays with that, you know? So it has been very, very, um, how do I say? It just hampers your confidence when, you know, people start talking about parents love you. Your relatives may love you for who you are and your skin tone, but it is the society and all the media and all the kind of uh, information that gets passed on, we start feeling shitty of our own skin color. Hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. Do you feel y you have resolved that issue within yourself? <sighs> I am still in that process, so, um, you know, to go to this uh, thing, um, actually, uh, there is this little bit of an incident, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of an incident which happened in my life, I think, when I started working, when I was in Bangalore. Uh, until then, you know, I was really never confident of my skin tone because I was always rejected as well. Oh, you're dark. Oh, we're not interested in dark boys and all of that jazz. But I think I met this um, lovely British couple uh, who came down and they were staying in Bangalore for a while. And uh, I met them through a common friend and, um, you know, we hit it off, right? So we hit it off in the, you know, in the fact that we were getting um, to know each other. We used to party and all of that. And during one of those conversations that, you know, we were having, um, they said that, you know what, oh, we love Indian skin color. And I was like, 
Come on, first and foremost, you're British, so I really don't know if you're cracking jokes or if you're being serious <laughs> or if you're being sarcastic, right? So I was curious about it and I said, why do you say that? And they told me this uh, very beautiful thing saying that, you know, Suresh, you are, you know, I mean, look at us. We are fair and we go in the sun, we turn red, we fall sick, uh, you know, we turn a different color. And for heaven's sake, we have to go ahead and sit or we have to bake ourselves under the sun, you know, so that we don't really, uh, you know, have any issues. But look at you. You're pretty much same every time. So I think I would rather have your skin tone than anybody else's, you know, at the snap of her fingers. I would love to do that. And for me, I think um, with regarding to my skin tone issues or my skin color, I think that's where it kind of brought that whole change. Mm -hmm. Though I'm still struggling with it at times, but I think the confidence level, which was at minus 200, it came up to probably, you know, 50, 60 percent. And, you know, from then it was a gradual progress for me to accept myself and be comfortable with myself. But I still struggle at times when people compliment me for my skin color and, oh, you're looking very beautiful. Oh, you're like the dark chocolate. I, you know, I want to believe it. And at the same time, I don't want to believe it. You know, I'm kind of in that um, flow. I mean, I have my partner who's, who's, I mean, he's, again, he's fair and I'm dark. But then he loves my skin color and he adores me for who I am. But I still have that, it's an ongoing process for me, you know, where it's still not completely resolved, but it's, I'm getting there. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned as, as a little boy. <clears throat> right. You, you had feminine mannerisms and whatnot. How did you learn about homosexuality when you were young? Or did you? <sighs> To be honest, I really didn't know anything about homosexuality until I got into college. Oh. So uh, I knew I was different right from the time I was in school. I knew I was completely different because when boys used to talk about girls and girls you talk about boys and I was like, why am I not able to think that way? You know, I used to look at a boy and I used to feel, oh, so cute. And you know, those butterfly things that runs and you know, you feel and you get that happy feeling. I was getting that when the guys in my school were talking about the girls and vice versa. And I was like, you know, why is it anybody talking like this? Like what I'm thinking. And um, <clears throat> I was not able to share it with anybody because I was getting bullied. So I used to kind of shy away from, you know, even talking about my feelings in that aspect. And, um, you know, for some reason, I thought that I'm the only odd person out. I'm the odd kid out in that. And I think until I came into college when I had access to internet is when I got to know that, oh, there is something called uh, gay, there is something called homosexuality, or, you know, guys can like guys and girls can like girls, all of that. So I think um, the word gay, I think I got to know only when I was in college, wow. I was able to. So when I was, one of the days when I was going back to my hostel rooms, is when I kind of said that out loud to myself, hey, Suresh, I think you're gay. You know, I, when I was able to say that to myself, I felt so relieved. I felt so nice about myself. Okay, so this is what it feels to be accepting of who you are or, you know, just understanding who you are. So I think that was, you know, um, yeah. But I still didn't tell anybody about that uh, because I was not sure because nobody spoke about it that time. Yeah. Right. So everybody was talking about, oh, I have a girlfriend. Oh, the girls usually I have a boyfriend. Oh, I don't like girls. I don't like boys. But they never said that they like the same sex, you know, mm -hmm. with intimacy, with the, with the, you know, with the sexual vibes. No, there were friendships, but there was nothing of this of the same sex. So I really wasn't sure where it was going. <laughs> well, if you accepted it within yourself, at least at that point, tell us about how you came out then. Oh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so after coming out to myself, um, I think uh, during college again, I decided to come out to my best friend and then, and um, for a simple fact is he was quite popular in college and um, 
I wanted him to know for a fact is I wanted to be myself with him because, you know, there were a lot of times I was faking and, you know, trying to tell him that, oh, you know what, maybe I like this girl, you know, maybe things can happen and all of that. But deep inside, I knew that's not happening. I just wanted to brush off, you know, those topics and conversations. <clears throat> One day I decided I'm going to come out to him. And I actually came out to him. I said, you know what, I'm gay. I, you know, this is who I am. I like guys. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you want to continue our friendship. It's absolutely fine if you kind of, you know, step away from this friendship. Uh, but I totally respect that. <clears throat> and I just walked off. I didn't wait for his reaction. And uh, for the next couple of days, I was, um, you know, avoiding him, not wanting to get into the conversation because somewhere I felt a little, you know, bad, guilty, all of those feelings came in. Like, you know, why did you have to say that out? Yeah. And then one of the days he just barged in and he had a, he confronted me. He's like, you know, what the hell is wrong with you? Why are you bringing up friendship in between this? Um, <clears throat> you know, everybody has a type, right? So I, as, uh, you know, he was talking about himself that he likes girls who are on the heavier side. And he said that there are a lot of other guys who like girls who are probably thin or who are slim, who have long hair, short hair, you know? I mean, everybody has, you know, a, a person that they really want to be with, right? So you have a person who's, pro you know, from the same sex, I don't understand that right now, but I'm fine with it because end of day, everybody has, you know, their own choice. Uh, so never, ever bring up friendship ever again. So, <clears throat> you know, when he said that, I think that was one of the most, um, I think, important moments for me because that he was the first person that I really, really came out to after yeah. coming out to myself. Yeah. So I think um, that really boosted my confidence, you know, from that first person perspective yeah how did it progress from there oh it was crazy i did come out to a couple more but then it didn't go that well <clears throat> but i still didn't get bothered that much and um i think <clears throat> as time progressed i had to come out to my parents <laughs> okay so here's a little thing about india i'm for sure everybody knows that in india marriages are predominantly done arranged and parents play a very important role in that and uh, for me also it kind of happened the same way um, my parents were you know saying all right Suresh it's time for you to settle down you know get married you know you need to take your family forward so you need to have kids and all of that while I was telling them, you know what, I don't want to get married. It's not a thing for me. And my all, all the things that my mom was saying is, oh, you're shying away from your responsibility, Suresh. You cannot do that. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so I left it to them. I was still avoiding. And uh, also in India, what happens is that we have something called horoscopes. You know, so horoscope matching has to happen. And... Even that time also, the horoscopes were not matching. You know, so I was telling my mom, you know, like, hey, you know what? Even God does not want me to get married. So why are you forcing me? <laughs> so, yeah. So in India, it kind of works. A lot of them actually have this, um, how do I say? It's, it's, it's an alignment of your stars and all of that, which kind of comes in a paper. And based on that alignment, you know, you try and align yours with the girl that you want to get married to and see if it really is for the better. Hopefully there's no going to be issues and blah, blah, blah. And uh, parents believe in that. And pr predominantly everybody in the culture, it's an Indian culture. So we believe in that. <clears throat> so that was not happening. And my mom was saying, no, Suresh, don't worry. You know, for every person, and there is another person there in your life so we have to search for that other person and the search continued and um, finally they found a girl and um, I was like uh -huh, okay all right so it's time to have a discussion by that time I knew m about myself I knew I was like very much into guys and I was like you know um, there's no way that I'm gonna fall in love with a girl or if I, I have a lot of friends who are girls but nothing you know physically Right. It's, it's only emotional connect and I can be the best friends and all of that, but nothing more. And I've made this conscious decision that I would never, ever get married to a girl because I didn't want to mess up her life for no fault of hers. 
Mm. Right. So when the time came, I told my parents that, hey, I'm gay and I don't want to get married to a girl because I'm not sexually attracted to a girl, but I have those attractions towards a guy. Uh, they flipped. <laughs> Uh, they really didn't understand what I was trying to tell them. And uh, it was a tough time. So, you know, there was a lot of um, anger, frustration, and, you know, crying definitely. And um, <clears throat> I think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things my parents took on themselves saying that what did we do wrong in our upbringing or the way we brought you up, then why are you like this? what made you uh, you know do like this did we do something in the past or you know they went back to their wrongdoings they said oh my god did we do something wrong that is affecting you like this and all of that so <clears throat> it was difficult and um but i think i held my fort in the fact that i said you know what i'm not going to fall for pressure I'm not going to fall for the emotional blackmail that's going to happen, you know, and say that I'm going to give in to marriage. So I had made wow. myself clear. And I also told them that I would never, you know, leave them. I would never leave them and go away for this reason. Uh, but I also had a backup plan. In the fact that um, if my parents had to throw me out, I reached out to my friends and I was ready with a bag. Wow. You're saying that if my parents are going to throw me out, then I'm going to come over to your place and all that. But I think my parents don't hate me for who I am or my choices. I think they're more concerned about my future. If I'm not getting married, then what's going to happen to you in the future? Who's going to take care of you? Because for them, they are very much in that you know, sphere of thought process that only a woman can take care of a man and she completes him, right? It doesn't go anywhere else or it doesn't go any other way. No. So for them to digest or even process that was a big thing. But I said, you know what? I'm going to be there. I'm going to be happy and I'm going to have a happy life. And I, you know, they still stay with me. So my parents live with me and I'm very much, um, you know, there and all of that. It's a process for them. And, um, you know, after that conversation that I had, yeah, a couple of three months, it was not that great. But I think uh, <clears throat> they're slowly understanding. They've not completely understood. They still shy away from having those conversations. But they never forced me to uh, get married again. Wow. Right. So they said you know what, yeah, it is your life, but at the same time, we would love for you to get married, but yeah. what to do? You know, I, I kind of realized that their hopes and dreams of me getting married have crashed, and they're still struggling with that. So I know that, you know, it's going to be a, an issue for them, but I'm going to be there, be supportive, and walk them through this process. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's my... I would say coming out story to my parents, but um, yeah, um, how do I say? I mean, I've been fortunate enough to have parents who didn't kick me out or throw me out, yeah. and uh, they struggle to understand, but they are there, they're supportive, they know quite a few things about me. And um, though as, may, as, as uncomfortable at, as it is for them, they're kind of letting me live my life. So I really appreciate them for that. Yeah. That's incredible strength. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's, it's crushing them within, but they are, you know, at least letting me live my life. Right. So I think I, I need to respect that. I need to honor that in every possible way I can. Absolutely. But yeah. it, it's my understanding that Indian culture is conservative about homosexuality. A am I correct in that? I'm sorry, I didn't get that question uh, done. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it's my understanding that uh -huh. Indian society is very conservative regarding homosexuality. Yeah. So how do you see that? I mean, uh, again, as I said, you know, again, thanks to Britishers. Um, because before Britishers coming in, I think India was very, very inclusive of everybody. 
and um, homosexuality was there, lesbians were there, trans community was very much popular oh. and very much there in the, you know, uh, society as such. Um, you know, even sex workers were also very much, you know, prominent. It was just that the, after Britishers coming in, things went way, uh, you know, in, with regarding to, I think, gender, sexual, uh, you know, um, as as form of even sexual art or, you know, sexual itself, anything sexual was kind of put down. <clears throat> you know, I always tell people, we are the land of Kama Sutra. We invented sex and we told people how to have sex. <laughs> but look at us now. But look at us now. For us... To even have a conversation on sex is considered a big, big taboo. Uh -huh. You know, there is, you know, even if you see movies, kissing never happens. Now, yes, yes, the kissing has gone a little bold. But before, if, if um, you know, if a guy and a girl had to kiss, they would show that it's kissing, but then they would get something in between that. Like, you know, two flowers. Yeah. You know, so that's how, um, you know, sex was spoken about or talked about. And it was never, you know, as a table of, you know, a conversation on the table. Mm -hmm. So it was always like, you know, it was between parents and parents do it, whatever they have to do does. And when the kid grows up and when they get married, they figure things out. You know, it's, it's all about they will figure it out. And... Um, yeah, I, I think with regard to homosexuality, that's how it really came in again, because of Section 377, you know, that being there for such a long time, that kind of really, you know, uh, brought in a lot of issues for us. And, um, you know, um, because the law was there, people said, oh, it's against the, you know, religion. It, they brought it even into the religious conversation, saying that it is wrong, it is a sin as you know i mean christianity says it's a sin and um, you know islam says it's a sin even hindus say it's a sin but i think our you know our culture hindu culture our mythologies everywhere i mean there was uh, i think gender fluidity was very common we had the gods transitioning to you know from a male version to a female version and you know, princes or, you know, the prince were um, dragging up in some form, uh, you know, or, or cross-dressing to escape certain, uh, you know, rituals. And we spoke about trans community in a different form altogether. So my, our Indian mythology has so much of uh, acceptance of, you know, various or, you know, uh, the, the whole spectrum that somehow it got lost. In, in years to come. So that's why it is still a phobia, you know, still you kind of call it and, you know, it's not the right thing. It's not the right choice because society looks down upon it and it is not the good thing to do. So, yeah, we still struggle. But um, for the, for the yeah. international audience, would you please explain mm -hmm. what is 377? Okay. <laughs> so... so Section 377, uh, I will give you the exact statement of what it says. Uh, just give me a quick moment. I'm going to pull that up. So um, they called it that anything, a carnal intercourse against the order of nature is considered punishable, is considered as a punishable offense. So if you need to have sex, you need to do it only when you are planning to procreate. If you're not procreating, you cannot have sex. Or um, how do I say, if you have any other form of sex, which is anal or oral, is considered to be against the order of nature. Got it. Right, so carnal intercourse, which means you need to have a penis vagina intercourse, that is called intercourse, which is not an order of, against the order of nature. Anything else is considered to be against the order of nature. Uh -huh. And um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, it is, it is a little crazy uh, thing. And this was, again, you know, Britishers really brought it in and they messed it up for us, you know. So 
um, I will read out the exact um, you know, um, law which says whoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman or animal shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall be liable to fine. So that was the law. Wow. Yeah. Oh. So it was crazy and it was predominantly uh, against, used against the gay men and the transgender community. Mm -hmm. Now, lesbians were never a part of this because uh, their intercourse never involved penises, right? It was only vaginas, so <laughs> they were never caught on it. And, mm -hmm. and also the heterosexual, uh, you know, all the men, the straight men enjoyed it because more the better, right? Instead of one woman, now you have two women who are having fun. So all the straight men used to enjoy lesbian porn more. Sure. Right. So it was never considered to be a taboo, but it was considered to be a, you know, a good thing. But when two men come into picture, they had issues and the trans community, when they come in, that's an issue because there, there was no penis vagina. It was more anal uh, penis, uh, you know, sex that was happening or there was oral sex that was happening. So, <clears throat> uh, I mean, yeah, that, that, that law brought in, a lot of um, issues with the community, especially the gay men. So the police used to bribe or used to go ahead and force them into bribery by you have to give them money. You know, there was a lot of harassment, bullying in every possible form. So it was not easy. And because of that and, and because of the stigma around the fact that if you're gay, you know, you're really looked down and, you know, if you're staying with parents, then it's going to be an embarrassing situation for the parents, right? So they always give in for that whole bribery or that, um, you know, thing, because you cannot go back to the cops and say, you know, he was harassing me. They right. would ask why. You know, it's like, oh, I was with another guy. Okay, so what were you doing with that guy? Oh, so were you kind of performing oral sex? Or were you giving a blowjob? Or were you fucking him? Or were you not? You know, all of those conversations used to come up. And, you know, people used to get, you know, really troubled. Because the moment it goes home, you know how it is. It's going to be a very awkward situation. So, yeah, I mean, it is still an issue. It's still a huge issue. But... I think with the law getting away, I think uh, the conversation has really come in from various aspects in regards to trying to normalize the conversation that yes, we exist and uh, we are very much part of the society. And, you know, yeah, there's a lot of work that's been happening since, uh, you know, September 6th, 2018. So on, on Facebook, you're open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How are you able to be openly gay on Facebook in your circumstances now? Uh, I came out in 2014. <laughs> so that was four years before Section 377 getting away. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I think, um, as I said, you know, if I have to go back and tell you there was this incident um, in childhood that I kind of went through. So um, because of the bullying and the harassment that was happening, um, I decided to kill myself and uh, not once, but three times. I tried to kill myself for oh. three times and it was unsuccessful. Uh, but the third time, something really stopped me. Something really stopped within me saying that, Suresh, you cannot do this. This is not the right thing for you to do. There is something, uh, you know, that you don't know right now, but there is something there for you, which is there in the future. <clears throat> at that point of time, I really didn't understand. But you know what? That Because that calling came in so prominent and it was very strong, I said, okay, I'm not going to do it. And I made a promise to myself that day, uh, you know, no matter what happens, I am going to go ahead and fight it out. Whatever the situation comes in, I think I'm never going to think of ending my life and I'm going to fight it out and I'm going to battle out no matter what. I'm going to march forward. So that's why, if you remember, I said, you know, my, though my college, I mean, my childhood, my schooling and my college was not that great, but
but I said I had to move on because I knew that I had to go past this and I need to figure that out. And uh, <clears throat> I was able to, in the sense like, um, you know, that kind of kept me going on. And that encouraged me to, you know, um, uh, identify myself, talk to my friends and, you know, come out to my parents because I, I kind of knew what it is. I know what it is to end my life. Yeah. I've kind of, I keep telling this, you've kissed death. So what's going, what more is going to scare you? Nothing. So Good go point. forward with that. Good point. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, anybody comes to me and kind of talks to me in a different way, I can give it back to them. What, what are they going to do maximum? Yeah. Kill me. All right. Go ahead. But I would live my life the way I want to live. Right. So that was very, you know, that was very strong in me. Yeah. And I think uh, after coming out to my parents, I felt this relief that I was not scared anymore, you know, because I was always worried about who's going to tell my parents that, you know, their son is gay. So now that that's over, that's behind me, I was like, you know what? There's no stopping back. <clears throat> so um, I actually uh, came out on Facebook in a very different way. So after coming out to my parents, I decided I'm going to walk my first Pride March. And, um, um, you know, I did that. And I think the next day morning after the Pride, I got up with a very happy smile on my face. So the dream was very clear and very vivid. I was at the edge of a cliff and I was looking down at people and I was screaming out loud and saying, I'm gay, I'm happy, and this is who I am. And the people below are all the folks from school, from college, some of them from work as well. And they're always screaming back to me, saying that, you go, Suresh, we love you, we are proud of you. And, you know, and, and with that smile on my face, I woke up. Wow. And I, that's when I decided, you know what, I think... Um, I think the world needs to know now. And I opened my Facebook. I, <laughs> that time I was a social media, you know, I, I was, uh, yeah, I was pretty much on social media all the time. And I opened and I did a life event on Facebook, you know, saying so finally out of the, coming out of the closet or out of the closet. So that was my headline. And I kind of wrote a little note on that. And I said, you know what, this is how I'm going to come out to everybody. Wow. And uh, yeah, I think ever since that, I, you know, you know uh, it has been, I mean, touch wood, I've been lucky, fortunate to have people around me who have been supportive and who have been there. I don't know how much is true because I go by people based on face value. If you're good to me, when we're having a conversation, I'm good to you. I don't care what you're talking behind my back because I think by that time I was way past it. Oh. You know, in the fact that I know people are going to bitch about me. I know people are going to crib about me or do something. But for me, what I knew is I just need to go forward. Right. So with that intent, I was just moving forward. And I think my kind of life took a complete different, amazing turn ever since I came out. Everything was going as an upward graph. Be it at work, be it with my advocacy about the community everywhere. So it was all, you know, the upward graph. So I was very happy about it. And my friends were very concerned. I would say that because I came out in a time when Section 377 was still there. And uh, they were like, more worried, hey, Suresh, what's going to happen to you? You're kind of putting yourself out there you know, on Facebook, on a social media platform where people can see you and know what you're doing and all of that. And I said, you know what? I, I'm tired of being scared. I think I'm done being scared of, you know, what are people going to think about me? I'm like, let them think. Anyways, they're going to think. Yeah. yeah. You know, whether it's good, bad or ugly, they're going to think any which ways. So with that, why do I have to live my life in a very different way so I can live my life the way I want to? So with that is when I said, you know what, I'm going to go on. Because, again, India is also a place where, you know, knocking anybody off is not a big, big thing. You know, if they just want to knock you off, you know, and the knock you off means, yeah, they can kill you or tip you off, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's not a big thing here. Yeah, but I think I felt that, you know, even if that's going to happen, I want to make sure that I live my, you know, take my last breath as being my true 
itself. That was my, you know, intent. And I said, you know, yeah, that's who I am. And that's what I want uh, people to remember me that I was, you know, I was not fake. I was genuine. I was honest and I was being myself. So, uh, I mean, that was a kind of boldness that I went on with. And that, kind of, you know, it didn't rub people the wrong way, to be honest. I think I was very... Um, um, approachable and I think um, I, you know the fact that I was not a brash person yeah. I never was aggressive I was the very um, um, I used to collaborate a lot if I had people who were against the views also I would say all right that's your view that's absolutely fine but can I live my life you know I'm not going to step into yours I'm you don't step into mine let's move forward Right, so with that intent, I think I didn't rub off too many people, but a lot of people got, um, you know, encouraged. They got uh, motivated and all of that. So I felt I'm doing something right, you know. So yeah, that that was me about being out and open there. Yeah. <laughs> but but how about professionally? Has it impacted you, work-wise? To be honest, again, there I was fortunate. I think my genuineness and my authenticity kind of really came through. Okay. Uh, I came out again. I came out to my manager, and I, you know, again, it was a Facebook event, so I did have my friends and colleagues as there, as well. Um, I, I think they applauded me for who I was and for what I was doing. Right. Um, but I don't know what they spoke behind my back. Again, as I said, I was really not concerned about that. But anyone who came across to me, spoke to me, they kind of just said good things about it, right? So I didn't kind of face that sort of discrimination that a lot of people uh, faced. And <clears throat> to be honest, at workplace also, I uh, initially for, you know, in my organization, I've been there with my organization for 16 years. But the first 10 years, I was in the closet very much until I came out to my parents. But after that, I was very much, you know, honest and, um, you know, being there and I put my work front, right? The first priority was work and that is the reason out there, but I was also being myself yeah. and that kind of really pushed and, you know, my productivity, my creativity, everything went completely authentic, right? So I was no more hiding behind anything and all of that. So they could see that my work was getting much better and, um, Surprisingly, I only got support. I was very, again, as I said, I'm very fortunate. You know, I would say, yes, I am that privileged person as a privileged out gay man who had a good, you know, support from various people. And uh, for me, it was more about how do I bring this out? How do I talk about this to people so that, you know, others get motivated? You know, be it the straight people or even people from the community who can get some confidence, some strength that they can just be themselves. Well, tell me a little bit about the gay scene in India. For example, gay bars, saunas, cruising areas. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so cruising areas, there are a lot, um, you know, because that is the only way that people used to meet before. There were no bars before. Initially, you know, the initial days, it was the parks, you know, like how it is there in San Francisco and all the, you know, the parks and all of that. So we had pretty much those cruising spots, um, you know, in India as well. Uh, slowly, steadily, there were some bars which were very, um, you know, okay with, the gay folks coming in. I think the lesbian community, there were not many lesbians out there. And even if they were there, were very much, uh, you know, hidden or not very out, but the gay men were out there. And, um, you know, we went to bars and there was parties happening. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think since the, um, uh, since the law being removed, I think there are some of these uh, places which have uh, been inclusive. But there is no specific prominent place. We don't have something like the Castro Street, okay. right? In okay. India, we don't have something like that, or you know, like the gay bar or you know the gay scene in New York or things like that. But then we have these small pockets, one two bars here and there, which are supportive. And then we have uh, one big um, hotel chain, which is again um, run by an out gay person. So he has opened up his hotel to all the gay community out there, which is called is the Lalit group of hotels. 
It's called okay. Lalit Group of Hotels. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So Lalit, yeah. So they have these uh, gay bars and they have this, uh, you know, dance bars and all of that, which are available. We don't have saunas. <laughs> yes, I would love for them to come down and see if they can happen here. <laughs> I have visited them when I was traveling, but yeah, you don't have them here. And uh, yeah, parties happen every weekend. There's a Saturday night party, which keeps happening in almost all the big cities. The small towns are not yet there, but uh, well-known places. Yeah, you know, in Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai, and then Bangalore, and some of the IT places uh, in, the, you know, the software technology cities are also being very um, out there. So yeah, we do have, it's growing, but Again, there is a little bit of reservation, um, you know, but we are changing. We're trying to work on that and tell them the bigger side as to, you know, we have the money to spend. Just, you know, accept us and just let us in and we will spend the money for you. <laughs> tell me about your title, Mr. Gay India. Tell, tell me all about that. <laughs> All right. So um, this has been starting off from um, 2014, 2015 is when it kind of started off. Okay. Um, it was more focused on community events in the sense like, are you out? Are you proud? Are you of the legal age? And are you a gay man? So this was more uh, specific towards gay men, right? Um, <clears throat> as Mr. Gay World India, so age no bar, color no bar, you know, physical stats no bar. All you needed to be is 18 plus out gay person and willing to do something for the community. So um, for me, I think I never knew about this until unless I really started, um, you know, ad, you know, doing a lot more work um, for the LGBT community within the corporate space and then, you know, taking it further, talking to a lot of organizations and, you know, while meeting a lot of people, this sort of thing came up. And I was like, by that time I was already in my, you know, thirties, mid thirties, I would say. Okay. And I was like, you know, should I really do it? <laughs> but, you know, the, the childhood dream that I had, I always wanted to do something like this, you know, be a part of the you know ramp walk and wear these amazing clothes and walk past you know for me i always saw that on television and somewhere down the line i envisioned myself to be a part of it right there was this this was young boy uh, you know young boys uh, you know passion or the dream to walk the ramp and all of that because that was something that i really enjoyed i did try to be a part of it again i got rejected because of my color and my mannerisms and all the way I used to walk and all. So I said, hey, can I do this now? And I told them I'm 37, you know, can I just be a part of it? Or what they said, yeah, obviously. I mean, jump in if you have the intent. I was like, wow, okay, let's go with it. <laughs> you know, and but I think on a larger context, I wanted to see how I can reach out beyond corporate space. Because this opportunity gives me, a, 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 you know, an opportunity for me to go to various other sections of the society, be it colleges, be it schools, be it to even, you know, grassroots level conversations. Yeah. And I think that really fueled. And I wanted to also break some stereotypes. Firstly, at the age of 37, you can still dream, you know, because in India, once you become 30, it's like, oh, you're almost half dead. Uh, you know, that's how it is. Like, you know, I, you know, ageism is again something which is uh, very prominent in India because, again, it's a very heteronormative society, right? By the age of 30, most of the guys and girls, girls are getting married even faster. But for guys, 30 is, you know, the age when they get married, they settle down, uh, you know, plus or minus two years. So between 28 and 32, a guy is married off. Right. So then they say, oh, you've moved into the next phase of your life, which is a family life. Right. So then you have your other responsibility. But as a single man, you, you know, 30 plus is considered like, oh, my God. So with that stereotype coming in there, I wanted to break it that you can really do what you want to do. 
And for gay men, it was even more difficult because finding partners was a big thing. Now, if you don't have a partner, oh, you're getting old. Oh, what are, who am I going to find? What are you going to do in your life? You're going to be all alone. Now, at that point of time, also, I wanted to kind of tell people, yes, you can go beyond that. You know, you can do your dreams. Because by that time, I had traveled abroad for a few places and I was able to, you know, figure things out. It's not that a bigger deal to be 35, 36. I think that's a, a ripe age or a good age, you know, where you have some of, I mean, where you have, you know, your senses and you probably have a flow as where you want to look at your life. But a lot of them here were really not sure. So I said, can I break that stereotype? And as a brown ass man, can I be a part of it and break that stereotype? Because as I said, being fair is considered for everything, anything, you know, being fair is good. So I want to break that. And being an IT professional, this is not something that a regular IT person would want to be a part of. Yeah. And then being a person who's bald. <laughs> <laughs> you know so again having hair is something very important and you you don't have hair and you start losing hair then you're you know there are a lot of these uh, you know small little cultural issues which kind of become a big problem for men okay. and then the other thing is about we have this differentiation between north india and south india so a lot of people from south really don't do this it's mostly people from north so i wanted to break that stereotype as well so I want to just break stereotypes and bring this conversation that we can really do something as well there. So with that intent, I went. And um, I wouldn't say that I didn't want to win. I always wanted to win. But uh, I said, I'm going to give my best. Yeah. Whatever happens, I'm going to have a good time because I'm going to get go, going to meet people, going to meet some amazing panelists, amazing judges, and learn from them. And uh, I won, voila. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I won that. And I think when I got the you know, prize, when they gave me the trophy, I just went back to the time um, when I was in childhood, which I you know, spoke about that purpose in life. What is that purpose in life that you have? I was able to see that purpose in life then when I was handed over that prize of winning Mr. Gay India. I knew I had to do something for the community because I think all the things that happened in my life from that moment when I tried to kill myself to the time that I won the title, I knew the whole process of building and you know the, the way I was getting molded by I think the universe or the forces of the universe knew or pushed me in that direction. And I was able to see the jigsaw puzzle pieces very clearly then. Okay. You know, so, you know, I was a trainer. I am a trainer. So, and, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that I speak good, um, you know, languages, at least English. I used to speak well. And I used to make myself clear. And I used to make myself confident, you know. So all of that lost thing as that young boy that I had, you know, given up on life to the time that I had kind of won the title, I knew what my purpose in life was. So I think that was my aha moment. Like, yes, now you know what you need to do. So I never shy away from having conversations with people. I never shy away to go to uh, you know organizations or events and do this because I know this is what I need to do. I have the privilege, you know, as uh, you know, from a friend who has been supportive to a parents who are kind of accepting to an organization which is supportive, friends who are also very more, I mean, my colleagues are very supportive. With that position, privilege and opportunity, can I do a lot more for the community? Yeah. You know, I think that was my bigger intent. And during that time, and by that time, I was already in a relationship and my partner was very supportive. You know, with that being said, with all the good things that I had in my bag, can I kind of go reach out to the masses? Tell them, yes, there is a possibility. At 37, you can win a title. At 35, you can have a boyfriend. You know, you can have a partner. You wow. Wow. can do things that you really want to do. Wow. You know, so I was like, wow. Okay, let's do this. Let's go on. And I got opportunities to speak at various, uh, you know, places in India and, 
and abroad as well. You know, I mean, before the Mr. Gay World India title also I did do as from a workplace perspective. But I think even after that also I did get opportunity. For me, it's all about talking, you know. If I'm outside India, I talk about what's happening in India. And when I'm within India, I talk about these grassroots level issues where people, the heterosexual people have the opportunity to bring that change. So can I influence them? Can I touch that chord, which, you know, can trigger them to, you know, become a, a supporter and ally for the community? I was doing that. So I kind of knew that, that Mr. Gay World India had a purpose and now I know what that is. Where is the contest held? Mumbai. <laughs> Okay. Is it? Yeah. So, yes, it is every year, uh, the last week of January, uh, which culminates uh, most of the times into uh, the Pride March. So the winner of Mr. Gay oh. India, uh, he walks uh, the Pride March in Mumbai. Oh, I didn't know there was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fascinating. So, yeah, it has been happening. <laughs> so, oh, that's fascinating. So, are there other organizations in India that support gay people? There are a lot of, uh, you know, community-based organizations which are very much there. So every, you know, state has a lot of these CBOs. They call it so community-based organizations, CBOs, or NGOs, you know, non-profit uh, organizations. So you have these CBOs and NGOs which work on grassroots level issues. Uh, be it for LGBTQ issues on a high level, it could be people living with HIV, HIV awareness, then, um, you know, for sex worker communities as well. So, you know, in the LGBT community, also it's more for the transgender community because the yes. trans community in India is really, really huge. And oh. in the sense, it, um, it does a lot of work because trans community in India is more prominent. and um, Okay. Than the lesbians and the gay community because they were out there all the time. Okay. I think um, even when uh, you know the government of India recognized uh, the trans community as a, as a third gender, though it is not appropriate, but at least they gave them that recognition. So, our government, um, you know, forms all the official forms by the government have male, female and others. So the others uh -oh. are to be inclusive of the transgender community, yes. But what about other aspects of the community? You've mentioned, of course, gay, lesbian, trans. Do you have a kinky community, other <laughs> groups? All right, so in with regards to BDSM or the kink community or the kink culture, um, it's, it's very pocketed and it's very, very secretive because uh -huh. again, sex is a taboo so with this kind of you know excess pleasure or extra pleasure is considered even more bad right so um i mean i was from a young a young age again thanks to porn <laughs> uh i got this opportunity to kind of um you know look at leather so and kink and all of that and i was never sure where does it really happen or what happens and blah, blah, because India, there was nothing of this sort happening. And even if it used to happen, it used to happen among the high class society people. Oh. Right. So um, for me, uh, my first experience, I would say, was when I was in uh, U.S. in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I was fortunate enough to attend the Folsom Street Fair. Yeah, and I think that kind of really, um, you know, gave me the opportunity to explore in the sense to understand, learn, and get to know what it is all about. See, yes, Folsom was there, but even before that, I did travel and I did come to US before. I did learn from other people as well. I, there was the, you know, the saunas, the bars, you know, you had the bear bars, the twink bars, the regular bars and all of that. So I was just learning all of that then. But Folsom took me to another level and I kind of knew, then I kind of knew, you know, what are my tastes? What do I like? What is it that I don't like? What excites me? And, um, for me, I wish we can really 
bring that i've been trying to see if any are there any people who are from the leather community here who are interested genuinely uh, but there are not many out there who are quite open and you know talking about this quite on openly but i'm trying to you know see and build and connect but yeah there's not much happening you know okay but i'd love to because i think we are quite kinky <laughs> it's just that i wish done the right way you know i think it's all about getting to know the right process and the right things and the right ways and how you can go about and enhance your pleasure so yeah coming back a little more serious now mm -hmm. there's a lot unfortunately there's a lot of violence toward transgender mm -hmm. people how is that in india yeah. Sorry, uh, I just went a little off the network, I guess. Can you hear me now, Doug? Yes, I can. So the question was... Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, can you repeat your question? Sure. There's, unfortunately, there's a lot mm -hmm. of violence toward gen transgendered people mm -hmm. in many places. Mm -hmm. How is the situation in India? Um... <clears throat> It is not easy, I would say, but having said that, um, it is not that difficult as well, I would say. I may be, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm gonna get beaten up for this or whatever, <laughs> for saying the wrong thing, but you know, I think the trans community in India is by large a very strong community by itself. You know, the, so we call them the Hijra community. The Hijra community is quite prominent in India and everybody knows about them. So with that being said, they have their own foothold in places. Yes, there is abuse by the police. There is um, abuse by the general public also. But um, I think it doesn't get that violent and extreme like how much we hear in the US and in Europe a lot more. And, you know, because from centuries and centuries, we know that there is a transgender community. The Hijra community is very well known to everyone. Okay. And they have their ways of surviving is through begging on the streets or through sex work, right? So with that being said, they are very known or very much known in the community and in the society. It is just that they're not integrated into the society. Hmm. Now, I know how the West or in the U.S., you know, though um, the Native Americans did have this as this third spirit or the second two-spirited people, but somehow it got lost. Hmm. And, you know, they never considered the transgender community to be, they, they still think that it is a new thing, but it is not. It has been there. It is just that they don't acknowledge it. Yeah. And I think the awareness factor for the trans community in the West is a lot more less. And that's why it becomes a little more violent. And um, also the other day I was watching this um, show on Netflix. I don't remember the name. Uh, it was about the transgender community and the visibility that they were having. I think, ah, um, oh, damn it, it was a very nice one. Give me a minute, I'm gonna pull that name out and tell you because I am telling everybody about this that you need to go watch that show. It was. It was an eye opener because I think the way even media was portraying the trans community was not in the right way. Uh, so I think that's when, you know, people are thinking the trans people are, you know, psychopaths or serial killers because that's how they were going about with that. So I will quickly share that name if you don't mind because I put that in my list of watching as well. Um, and I'm like recommending that that to everyone possible saying that you need to go watch that oh. okay for some reason i'm not getting that now it's called contagious or something like that okay i will i will if if i don't get it now while we talk i disclosure yes disclosure disclosure okay okay yeah it's a documentary series which was just released a couple of um, uh, i think a week back so it oh. is a must watch 
Okay. It is about all the trans community, which are, uh, you know, which have a representation and the struggles that they have gone through in the form of Bollywood, I mean, the form of Hollywood in the form of regular, you know, awareness. So I kind of realized that. And then I was thinking about, you know what, in India, how it is. Yes, the trans community are very well known. They're always seen anywhere. Yes, they are looked down upon. They they, you know, they are put in a very derogatory way, but their existence is not um, lost. They're, they're very much prominent. I think in India, for some of the gay right movements or the LGBT movements, they are the first ones to come out there and fight for it. Ah, good. You know, and yeah. So I think the trans community, I think across the globe, have been, been the ones who've been very vocal and uh, who have kind of contributed a lot towards the LGBT movement in their specific countries as well. I think even the same in the US, right? It was the trans people who kind of came out. I mean, the whole Stonewall incident yes. was because of the trans people out there and the police brutality that kind of really came in. Even in India, if you see anywhere that you see, you know, even during the pride marches, you would see a lot of the transgender community people coming out there, celebrating, being themselves, while the other sections of the community also being there. But they are there out in the front, coming out and doing the work as well, because they are somewhere associated to the, um, how do I say, they're associated to the nonprofits and the CBOs as well. So they kind of really do have that whole conversation going out there. What advice can you give mm -hmm. to people in India who want to come out? Uh, an advice, I think, uh, first and foremost, accept yourself for who you are, come out to yourself first, and then I would say, um, <clears throat> don't give up or don't give in to family pressure. I know it is very easy and it's very prominent. Um, don't give in, but at the same time, be independent financially as well. So that if something does not go right, then you need to take off and, you know, find your way to mend. And even if you're not able to, I think there are a lot of organizations and a lot of help that one can find now these days through the social media and all of that, that we can try and help you all out. So there is a way to live your authentic life. Just be patient and, you know, find the right time because a lot of environments are not very good especially during COVID situation is really horrible. A lot of people are staying in very homophobic environments. So don't give up, hang in there. Once situation gets better, take a call and do the right thing. What is the biggest misconception about you? Um, can you repeat that question again, Doug? Sorry, I think there were some internet issues. What is the biggest misconception about you? <laughs> misconception i think i'm too arrogant non-approachable um thinks very high of himself i think that's the misconception people have and um yeah i mean that's what i've heard people think <laughs> i have attitude um and yeah yeah all of that well suresh I would like to thank you very much for this amazing interview. Thank you. <laughs> again, a pleasure being acquainted with you. And I hope I will meet you in person sometime, either in Europe or in India or here in the US.